So if you're not here, put your hand up. <laughs> uh, I expected there'd be one in the crowd, but not half of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I prophesied my own problem, didn't I? <laughs> okay. All right, I got myself on the timer this time. I'm going to, um, we're going to hit this. So I want to uh, talk about a, an aspect that I think God is highlighting at this time that is on this journey we are on to this next transition. And um, it's interesting, even in my workplace, there are things that I see popping up where the, where the enemy is trying to imitate what we are supposed to already gathered. And it's quite common that the enemy listens to everything that the church is told. He doesn't actually know how God is going to do it because as we know that great scripture, if the devil had known that by crucifying Christ it would have destroyed him, he wouldn't have done it. Yeah. And of course, you know, pretty easy for Jesus to inflame the devil into doing everything that he did because the guy is so dumb. <laughs> he's, he's dumb in terms of he, his pride means he, he makes assumptions about God that are wrong. But he also knows us really well and sets us up until we get a bit wiser. So I want, to, I want to bring alive in you a deeper desire to hear God speak to you. That it would build an, in, an unquenchable thirst inside of your life to actually have even more encounters with God. So in, when we use the phrase encounters with God, we start to think about, well, I was, I've been waiting for God to do something different. No, an encounter for God can... I often say to people I pray for for healing... Well, what I want you to do is I want you to lay down on your bed this afternoon. This is usually on a Sunday morning, Sunday at church. Go back in the afternoon, you had lunch, put the kids out of the room. I want you to go back and lay down on your bed and I want you to imagine again the exact same anointing that I prayed for you and how you felt and I want you to pull that anointing on yourself and then I want you to start to talk to God about how he is shifting this illness out of your body as you abide in his presence. And then you will understand that you can bring that anointing on yourself at any time, anywhere, for any need and I want you to stay under that as often as it takes for you to break the fear of sickness because half the time we get a symptom and we shift to well I'll get beaten by the enemy on this and we're already in defeat mode well how, how, what will I do about my time off work because I'm going to get sick well, hang on that, I, I've gone straight from a symptom to total defeat without even having a conversation with God and I've been given weapons of warfare that pull down the enemy's darts so I, I it's important. I, I took to heart a word that um, Lance Warnell gave me when he was here on the Gold Coast, which, which might help you understand why I do things differently to others. He said, be a good rabbi, teach people how to think. And I've always, I really liked that because it captured something that was in my heart. It's like, if I could give you something, it would be strategies that you could use to be independently dependent upon God. So independent of whether I'm doing this or some leader's doing this or teaching in there, but you'll be in, able to source access and process what God is saying to you in a way that, that the anointed one and his anointing will teach you all things you need to know. Now, he's going to use others as well because he set up the church and I need to be interdependent with other members of the church because we all hit blocks. But my general attitude should not be one of an orphan and unempowered. It should be of, I am a son. My father came to give me a message today and I'm gonna, it's going to be easy to un, unpack it. It's not going to be a struggle. So to achieve more through faith, we must ultimately hear God more. Sounds pretty simple, but this is a time in which actually, to me, I'm not hearing the voice of God as much as I would a decade ago. Not for you, pray for you guys, easy, but for me. And I also don't see the word of God standing up in church very often. Now, I, I understand I travel with a prophet and she'll give a word everywhere she goes. She's what you call a nabby prophet. A bubble, like the word means bubble up, overflow. Whereas I get into, into a meeting, I'm a seer anointing. I want to give you strategies for how you will understand what God is doing and for you to feel as confident in that as I feel in that. And I want to um, unpack uh, times about that. I want to unpack my understanding of how you can uh, independently start to assess how you're progressing in that which God is doing. So the seer uh, anointing is about uh, understanding more about the counsel of God. 
So I'm not necessarily about giving you, you shall do this, followed by this, followed by this, but more about if I explain to you the season you're in, the challenges that you're facing, and the tools you have at your disposal, you will progress through this season well. And you'll know that you're progressing well. And, I'll, and by the fact that I, I can re- and draw from you a witness to what I'm saying because I'm identifying with what God's already saying to you already, then you'll go further. So that's, th- that's a different shift. Whereas the, the, the Nabi prophet, the Nabi prophet's one, well, you, you need a word. So let me give you a word. And, and let keep you on your journey. It keeps the motor going. And we all need our motor to keep going. That's why there's a great thing the Lord said, you know, that it's encouragement, it's comfort, it's exhortation. To prophesy over as many people as possible. It's interesting that the, the giver of the law, so to speak, Moses, was the person in the Bible who said, oh, I wish that all God's people were prophets. This is a guy who we credit with the law and how, and you're thinking, oh, crushing and do all these rules. And when they tried to shut down the 70 people who were prophesying outside of the camp of leadership, he, he responded with, I wish every person was a prophet. Because he understood the power of that to, sh- to lead a nation, to keep a nation on track, to keep people aware of what it is that God's promised over their life. So it's important that we can do that for ourselves as well. So hearing, on God, hearing from God opens up the glory he's placed on the inside of us. So when that word connects with your DNA in the spirit, you come alive. It's not because of the content of the word so much as the fact that the divine word that went in and formed you and gave you life is revisiting you again. Because you were formed when he spoke and breathed into you. So this word comes to you and you come alive. Because that's, that's, that's the dynamic he set up at the beginning of creation. Pick up. Let there be life. So when every time you and I hear the power of his word internally, my DNA in the spirit, go, whoa, that's my creator talking to me. This is my home turf. I own this space. I'm meant to live in this space. I'm meant to get lots and lots and lots of things out of this. And it's meant to be so creative. Now, I'm a choleric temperament. I I mentioned that before. So cholerics are not very creative. We're, We're quite straight up. We're not, we're not the life of the party. I'm the guy in a big crowd. I'm the hiding in the corner, trying to find one person only to talk to. But I, <laughs> and I avoid the front row at church. Although I married the wrong person to pull that off. <laughs> you ask me every second, Do you want to sit up the front? No, I don't want to sit up the front. I love it down the back. Now, why I mention that is like, but I press into God because His personality is creative. Because he is so good at it. I am impassioned by how beautiful he makes stuff. I'm impassioned by how much he makes you beautiful. Me look okay. It's it's, it's amazing. And he uses colour, he uses craft, he uses skills. And I look at people who are great at what they do. And I'm captivated by it. And people who can write songs that don't sound like me in a back room as a 13-year-old for tape recorder. You know, they sound like they came from heaven. And I love that. And, and, I, and I say to God, unless you actually make me more creative, I'll actually be under knowing you. You know what I mean? How can I experience all that you are? You're this amazing, amazing, amazing. And, and so it, doesn't, it can't come down to my personality. I actually, so I go to God and I, ta- I, come, and, I come and war over those limits rather than accept them. So no matter what your temperament type is, we need to be comfortable in different spaces because God is, God is everything. Like all personalities, all expressions, all everything. And I know we'll never get it all, but why wouldn't I sit there and go, God, make me creative, make me appreciate this thing. So there's lots more things I appreciate more than I used to. And hopefully one day I'll actually be able to be used in those things as well. But it's not going to happen unless I actually press in and press at those limits and edges and go, push that boundary out, God. Enlarge my stakes of my tent. Take out my boundary. Give me stronger stuff. Enlarge me, not just in terms of my calling or anything like that. I mean, just to, underst- just to have a capacity to appreciate you and when you're at work. And so when I'm praying for someone and God says, do X, well, I'm going to be in faith about that because that's my God. In other words, I'll sit there and go, well, I'm not that personality. 
you know, well, get out of your own good way, will you? <laughs> and let's get on with God. So, if we think about God, he gave us five senses. He said, taste his goodness, see his beauty so we can worship him, feel and sense his presence around us, giving us protection and comfort, smell the fragrance of God around about you, hear his voice. All of us to lead to hearing him in a complete sense. Hearing God is not about hearing a voice, is it? God is far bigger than that. Hearing God is about allowing him to be that big. I'll struggle to describe it, but you know where I'm going. So in other words, if I say I'm hearing God and I'm hearing his heart on a matter, I'm actually being impacted by how he feels about it, how he, how he draws life around it, the stories of what he's done in that area. So you imagine the, the colour, the tastes of fragrance around the word redemption. If, if God sat there and just mentored me and said, just one, I'm just going to unpack for you one word, redemption. This is what it means to me. And this is, this is what I did and how I did it and how I felt at the time I did it and, and how I get so excited by the fact that all creation's going to come back. And, you know, it just would, it would transform your life. But it wouldn't be about God lecturing Jeff style, this is how you get to this. You know, it would be an encounter with God, wouldn't it? So your spirit man has five senses the same as your natural man has it. So when you encounter the God realm in your spirit man, so you're new creation man. You are a spirit, you possess a soul and you live in a body. Pretty element. That's 101 so in case anyone's a new person to Christianity. So you, you are a spirit. God is a spirit. You're made in the nature of God but you're housed in a body in this era. When you die, you step out of that body and your spirit is, re is back into the presence of God who is a spirit. So the DNA of our spirit man includes the five senses. So as I said, I just went through to you. Taste, sight, touch, smell, hearing. Those physiological capacities and organisms that provide us a data fit perception. So we're getting data. We, we, we walk into a room, we're smelling mum's cooking, we're hearing conversation, we're, we're, we're seeing furniture we're familiar with, we, we, we get hugged and we're in this family setting and we're taken back to life as a child. I'm completely captivated, I'm back to the first time or maybe, maybe many, many memories of the same experience. I'm captivated. That's meant to be our experience of God. I'm captivated by a new occasion but I've been drawn back to who he is every time. And by my five senses that are in my spirit, man, I'm allowing that to happen. But these senses overlap, even in the natural. You know, a scientist's definition would see our five senses as overlapping and separate. So when, I, when he says, taste that the Lord is good, it's hardly a rhyme. No, we don't quite get to lick his hand. But you can tangibly go, something about getting a taste of God being next to me, getting a taste of his, the way he looks at me. I, I, I move into going, I'm, I'm tasting the goodness of God without even physically having that capacity. But that's, that's who he is. So they cause us to, there are a number of inputs that we perceive how we're taking in not just an environment, but now in the midst of it, he communicates something about who he is or who we are to him. And that additional data, now I, I am meant to process that by taking in all those other senses at the same time. So I meant, okay, God, you're speaking to me. What are you saying about how you feel about me? And then, but I really know what he's saying about me. I'm going to look into his eyes. You really mean that about me? And then I'm going to feel the cloak of his presence come on my shoulders. I'm going to feel it on my heart. I'm going to feel his presence. And I'm going to go, you just remind me how good you are to me. I, I have spent 40 years tasting of your goodness. You've been faithful to me. I'm, ha I'm experiencing the word of God through my spirit man's senses that now bring a word into an encounter with God. Because God is not, although he majors on his word, because by his word all things are created and nothing is created that was not created through the power of his word. But even the senses that are now perceiving his word were created by him so I could have capacity to take in more than his word. He is far bigger than his word. I am that I am. And that's one of the difficulties in trying to describe the subject. In addition, 
We've been wired to store and reprocess inputs in order to come to a greater clarity and deeper experience of those inputs. So we can store up memories, experiences, conversations that I can reaccess at a later time and reprocess what that means to me. So you caught on the fly. Someone gives you a, a word of encouragement. You keep going with what you're doing, you get home. You redraw on that data, the way they looked at me, what they've said, the tone of voice, the setting, how much they might have stepped out of the other conversation and make space for me only, make me feel important. I reprocess going, wow. Or someone makes an off-the-hand comment, you don't have to really have them dig it or not, you process it later and go, hmm, yeah. So we had that store facility, but we don't just restore words, we restore the whole environment. We take in the context. What were the eyes looking like? What was the face looking like? Was this, was this the wrong words but with a gentle face? I misunderstood. I can tell I misunderstood because no one can love you that much while they're saying something so I didn't hear correctly. You know, I can readjust my interpretation, my, my eventual output. So, I didn't, so in our spirit man... That's why I say to people, you know, my first pastor when we were in the charismatic move, I was in a spirit-filled church of Christ. And I was, and the moment I got spirit-filled, I started to prophesy and move in word of knowledge and word of wisdom and um, tongues of interpretation. And I said to him, what do you do with all this stuff? He said, well, what do you do? Is every time you get touched from God, you go back and you sit down and you ask God to tell you what he's doing in your life. So, that was also a good way to keep an 18-year-old long-haired bearded bikey from disrupting the meetings. <laughs> and I would go back from the order call and I would covet my space. I would find the loneliest chair. I would sit there. Come on, God, you're doing something. What are you doing? What, what, tell me what you're doing. I mean, I'm not, not you know, it, had, it wasn't obsessive. But it was like, well, he touched me to do something. God's not just, you know, handing out lollies. So I'd, I'd nurture that around my life and I still value that to this day. I, I spend the last 15 minutes of every day I try to go back and re-nurture what God has been inputting into me, sensory and otherwise, during the day and try and deepen the processing of that. Is there something in value in that encounter that I haven't processed yet? So God's anointing does not come to make us feel good. He's doing something. So therefore, when we're experiencing God, He's he may, and, he, and like... One of my most profound encounters with God, I was in a job that I, I had come out of working for myself after 17 years and uh, went and took a traditional job and that was a really, really difficult experience for me. Um, it, it was a real, like the death of a quite a few things. And, I, and about nine months into that, and I used to walk up the hill to the first location and they shifted us out of... Um, um, that location into the city and I walk up the hill and say, God, I hope you, I hope you don't forget me. I'm walking up here in faith. I've got to have a job to look after my family. But honestly, no one knows I exist anymore. I said, please don't forget me. Don't, don't. No, I, I, I'm in my heart. It's like I've just such a deaf to the vision. I just said, I hope you don't forget me. And about nine months into this, I'm walking back to the station one afternoon and God spoke to me as clear as anything. He said, and I was singing, I uh, had music playing in my ears, just doing the thing and I was singing to God and says, you're my delight. And, and it just melted me like I've not been melted even in the middle of some healing. And I sat on that train in the midst of hundreds of people on the way back and I just coveted that and draw every feeling, every thought, every fragrance, every moment, every expression out of his face I could find. I drew that around my life and I said I can't believe you feel that way about me so like that was not a convenient location but a discipline of being able to make God the centre of the whole world in the middle of Central Station and a train on the way you know 45 minute journey on a train I never dropped for a moment you know keeping it on because he built me that way I could store that I could reaccess that I could expand on that by thinking of every sense that I could experience God and, God and God kept enjoying the experience you know as I pressed in he was pressing on so I was like you know I'm hugging closer he's hugging closer and the experience is getting bigger and that's that's why he hardwired us to do that so to, for someone who struggles maybe some people who 
and you could be like I was, you know, where you didn't give ready access to your emotions. I want you to close your eyes. I want to take you for a quick little example of, of using your five senses of your spirit man. And of course, you don't disconnect your natural man altogether. You, you're never, while we're on this earth, we're never totally separated. But I want, I want you to, so close your eyes. And this is the setting. You're the child of a father that's let you down badly. And, um, I, and I'm that father. I'm, I'm the person who's let you down. And, I, and I've lied to you, let you down. Um, and I've even, you know, through that, you've experienced loss in your life. Sorry, it's the other way around. My apologies. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You are my child. Yeah. You're my child. You're the... You're the um, the, the, pr- the child that's actually let me down, the parent, lied to me, lied to others, stolen, and done a lot of harm and, and hurt in the relationships. And I've decided that I want to forgive you and let you know that I forgive you. So in this first setting, you, you come home to, to your place. You're living in your own place. And you find on the kitchen table a white piece of cardboard and I've written on that sign saying, I forgive you, I miss you, I forgive you. How do you feel about that? You've done, you've done everything wrong, but now someone says, I just miss you, forgive you. So just store that for a moment. Now I want you to imagine you come home, but not just the sign on the table, but but around the sign I've placed a dozen fragrant roses to both beautify and make aroma around that whole sign of I forgive you, I miss you, I forgive you. How does that make you feel? Now we have another setting that you come home and you find the sign there and you find the roses and you find all around the kitchen I've also gone in and prepared your favourite meal. It's all prepared. Maybe it's still sitting on the stove and the aromas are there. I forgive you, I miss you, I forgive you. How, do you. how does that speak to you? Now I'll take you into another setting. You come home, there's the sign, the roses, the fragrance, the meal that's been prepared with loving hands, just the one you love, the aromas, and I also have your favourite music playing gently in the background as well. This is your home. I've come into it. I've brought my forgiveness into that place. How does that make you feel? Now the next setting is I've put the sign written with my own hand. I've put the roses, prepared the meal, with the music playing. And as you're standing there looking at this, I call you on the phone and tell you in person that I forgive you and I miss you, that I forgive you. The music's playing and the food's there. Then in the next setting, you've got the sign and the roses and the meal, your music, your favourite music's playing that we used to listen to together. And I'm talking to you on the phone, telling you, how much I miss you and I forgive you. And now I walk in from the other room and hold you and look in your eyes and tell you I miss you and I forgive you. That's a... How do you feel now? What we're doing here is we're, we're encountering 
God for a range of senses to deepen and experience all he is about all he, we are to him. And a very small example. But this is a description of the completeness of how we can encounter God rather than just hearing a word. We can experience God as he is that word to us. So, so bless you, you can come back out of that exercise. How many people found as each dimension was added, it, shift, it deepened it for you? Yep. So I wasn't trying to make anyone upset. <laughs> it, was, it was hard to think of it. But I wanted to... But you can see that by adding another layer, taste and see that the Lord is good. The fragrance of God. His voice. That His voice walking into the room. And the fact that it's not about an individual action. It's all He is to all that we are. Is what we're trying to experience. So he engages all of our senses because he created them and he expects and longs for us to make room for that. And so you and I can get a word, even a brother here might give me a word during the day and I'll go back in the quietness of my space. I have the faculty to reprocess that. And I invite God in, not talk about God. Remember that I found myself becoming aware I was quite poorly handling the opportunities God gave me because I was talking to myself about God, not talking with God to let God restart the conversation again. So a lot of times the word that we get, he's going, come back and talk to me about that. Come back, I've got more to say. Let's, let's meet together. Let's, let's come together. There's more I want to unpack about you, just with you. So he's, he's jealous for us. And we've, we've got to make more room for him. Because nature does not allow a vacuum. We will fill that space with white noise, TV, Facebook, family activities, hobbies, thoughts about how to survive at work. It will be filled with something. And Jesus said, when you go to pray to your father, lock, go into your home, lock the door, Everybody else out. Go into your room. Push out of... Go into your bedroom where you limit what activities. Your bedroom speaks of limited activities, doesn't it? You go to sleep or to be in a relationship with your spouse. There's, you know, they're the things. It's an intimate... So God says, not just, don't just shut the world out. This has got to be an intimate setting to you. This has got to be an intimate place where you and I, where you and the Father are in communion. And he is jealous of that space. Bedroom speaks of, only one person goes in there with you. Your beloved, your wedded one. And that's the way he feels about it. So did you know also that your five senses are called methods of perception? It's a choice of channel for reception along with all the variables to determine not only conclusions but the depth of those conclusions. As I gave those other layers, the depth of the conclusion of how much he forgave how much it meant to him to want to forgive was deepened, wasn't it? So that's the point about reprocessing and, and, and communing with God in our spirit, man. It, it changes depth for which, because applied truth is now becoming truth. But mental truth or, or skimming level of us, of, we can read the whole Logos. But honestly, you cannot fulfill the Christian life on the Bible as a written word. You must fulfill the Christian life on a rhema, which is God speaking to us. So all the knowledge of God in the world will not bring us into intimacy and all the revisiting of a prophetic word or revisiting of something he said nice during the day without inviting him into to a communion with us is actually not going to bring us into intimacy with God either. The other thing that they talk about in terms of senses and communications is what they call disambiguation which comes from the word ambiguity. So to, t to remove the double meaning, to remove the other alternative explanations for a word or for an experience. 
So this is my this is my interpretation of this in terms of five senses. The problem with the natural language is there's often many senses of the same many expressions of the same word. So I talked before on talk about terminus and I read you out a list of all, a list of alternate wordings that you could use. And as we went through it, you could see how the prophetic word I got from God, that word terminus really fitted and you could see what way it fitted because you got the whole picture. I reevaluated that word in the context of the larger word. Thank you. Um, that was a timer, not a call. Um, <laughs> so what I do is I need to use my other senses to not only understand what I'm hearing but to rank what I'm hearing in terms of its importance because the person who said it is still speaking it to me. Just merely going back and analysing that counter or word on my own is mental ascension. So I go back with God's presence. God, you said you're my delight. Can you tell me what that means to you? You know, my wife's a classic for this. <laughs> Everyone gets a real goodie. I got a great one. And she says, I say, darling, I love you so much. Tell me more. <laughs> it's always tell me more. I go, I fall for it every single time. And I'll go and find some other expressions and bring it up. She goes, that's really good. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, so I'm adorable, and I, in other words, can you just pull that all back into one big sentence all over again for me, please? <laughs> I must be doing well if I'm getting the A word, uh, the adorable. And, uh, you know, it's just like, I'm going, yeah, that's, that's us. I mean, I, I watch it because I'm a different personality. I watch it and go, that's the way I'm supposed to be with God. You know, he says something. And I say, tell me more. Like, we're sitting there going, well, I don't want to bother him. He's really busy. <laughs> you know, I was lucky to get that word. No, no, no. He's got, he wants us to... He's, he's like, God, tell me more. When he said that word, delight for me, you couldn't... Sh- I, I, I ignored everybody for a week. I, it was one of the most impacting occasions of my life where a word went so deep into me. And I kept unpacking, unpacking, unpacking because I kept going, you tell me about it. And, and, and it means this, did you mean that? And, and I just kept working with it. Honestly, and even every time it even went... Like, Seemed like I finished the conversation. No, I'm not willing to give up yet. I went back and back and back. I wanted that. I wanted it to be, you know, it wasn't just need. I was sort of going like, this is, an in, this is a, a conversation I have not had. And God just jumped in the middle of my life, in the middle of a walk to Central Station, in the middle of a really difficult time, not to tell me you're doing the good thing in a good, difficult time, but tell me he loved me full stop. And it was a sense of the eternal. For me, it was like yesterday, today, tomorrow. It was not about handling some situation right. It was not about my choleric personality processing data. It was transcending that and going, you who I love. So because we're lazy, you often prefer the comfort of the familiar. So we overuse some senses and don't use others. So I come up with shallow interpretations, shallow communications, and incomplete encounters of God. And I, I, can, I have a sense that to God, although we've missed it on some of the previous encounters, if we choose to and go back into his presence and go, I missed it on that, can we start that conversation again? I bet you he will re-engage with us. Because he's never... Because that word, that encounter came out of desire of his heart to know us and for us to know him. That same desire is never going to squel. You know, it's going to be there forever. And I think we can revisit those. And that's one of the things about our faculties in the spirit man. Because the Holy Spirit says he'll bring all things back to our mind, that which the Lord has spoken to us. So I believe we can revisit those. So if you're thinking of some things where, hey, he spoke to me and I really didn't really press in with that, or I really didn't handle that um, uh, in such a way honourably to the Lord and take the time out. I got busy. Go back. Lock yourself in your closet, as Jesus said, and revisit those. There are no vacuums. We fill our lives with words other than the words of God. We're going to be misled by other voices, including the natural man, key people of influence, past disappointments, our own failures we keep rehearsing in our head. Honestly, di- this stuff of communing with God is actually how we live in a prophetic constant sense. 
because I'm constantly being transformed by the power of his word, which is moving me towards the word being completed. And I'm not looking over my shoulder. I'm not fearing what's behind me. I'm not really evaluating all the natural man, which is supposed to have been put to the cross. I'm actually looking at and constantly gazing into the miracle, which is my new creation life. So this kind of encounter leads me into the relationship he wants us to have. He created words and everything in them through which he moved the dust of nothingness to create manifest beauty and gave us creativity, reproductivity and then crowned us with glory and majesty. We were made to commune in his presence. He actually equipped us to to come into his presence through Christ, in Christ. Because when he looks at you and I, we're literally in Christ standing at the throne right there with him. I mean, something I've never tried that just popped into my mind then. Imagine if you could ask the Father if you could have a listen to a conversation between the Father and the Son and how much he loved him. Imagine what God would be saying about Jesus. I should do that. Just think about that. Just think, God, let me listen to what you guys, not the big strategy stuff. Tell me about when you created the earth. And wisdom was your daily delight. You danced before him, Jesus, as wisdom. And nothing was created, wasn't created for you. And you were constantly the Father's delight. And you danced and you sang and you jumped and you leaped for joy. What did you do when the solar systems exploded into existence? What did you do when you threw your arm over and all the colour came out and every plant, every molecule? And then you looked down in creation and saw us dancing and jumping and enjoying a bushwalk, riding a motorbike down a country road. <laughs> whatever it is so so let's have a look at some of those things I'll save you uh, just due to time I'm just going to quickly read these scriptures out for you Jeremiah 23 verses 18 and 22 you can go there if you want but I'm going to quickly move through these to expand to you how this is not this is really locked in um, scripture for all of us Jeremiah 22, 23 verse 18 says "For who has stood in the council of the Lord And has perceived and heard his word. Who has marked his word and heard it. In the um, the original language they have four different Strong's words. They're not just the, the writer trying to be creative. Verse 22 says, But if they had stood in my counsel, had caused my people to hear my words, they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Habakkuk 1.1, the burden which the prophet saw. Hang on, what's a burden look like? I thought a burden was a sense of empathy for a problem, that he saw it. Habakkuk 2.1 says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. I will watch and see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. I love that. There's a responsibility to allow us to let that word in. But then when it's in, it will be a correction. In this instance, Habakkuk was having a big whinge to God, which God actually never answered that particular situation. It did all, why the evil prosper? And God never answers that question in all of Scripture. But he did give Habakkuk one of the greatest words ever given. He ignored all of that and said, but the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther nailed that thing to a wall in 1500 and something or other and transformed the church for all eternity. That we live and we walk with God by faith. That was given to Habakkuk as he complained about why the wicked prospered. But he, you see here a, a, a process. Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. I have set a watchman on the walls of Jerusalem. They should never hold their peace day and night. You who make mention of the Lord, not of a complaint, but make mention of the Lord. These watchmen were actually engaged with God, about God. They were caught up with God while standing their watch. Whereas we go, intercessors are in there working away tirelessly to shift something. These watchmen were actually in the spirit with God, waiting for the counsel of God to then go and use that as the ultimate leverage on any problems. Make mention of the Lord and do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. 
How can anyone see what God says? And what it's telling me is that there is a process here. So, so, so there's a progression. To really see in verse 18 of Jeremiah there that I quoted, we go from perceive, I'm aware of something, I don't quite know what it is yet. I hear, so I start to add to my, my touch and other senses um, hearing, but also a word that I'm now starting to process it that's in my own language and it's in my own, uh, it's another dimension of me. And it says, then marked. So it's like when you mark, you, 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 you put at a point um, of delineation. This was going to change something. I marked this. I marked that point. This has come into my life. This is, this is something that I'm accountable for. It's something that's memorable. I mark it. I make a point. And I, I sort of anchor that down in this encounter now. So I'm, I'm, I'm stepping this up. This is what the Lord's drawing a picture of. And then it says, then I hear. The final outcome is, then I actually hear. So I'm, I'm getting different inputs. I'm starting to wrestle with those inputs. I'm asking for more. I make a point where actually that bit stays. I'm removing the disambiguity the ambiguity of the situation. Maybe he means this, maybe because I'm staying in the place of conversation. I'm staying where I'm listening and taking more and more input till I finally go, I know what I'm hearing. My whole body knows what I'm hearing. My whole spirit knows what I'm hearing. This is what I would call deep listening of God. And the other thing is it actually talks about the counsel of the Lord. And that's a really interesting study if you get time to go into it. Because it says those who stand and who are those who will listen to the Lord in the way that he engages with us get invited into the council of the Lord. And that council is a close deliberation where God actually shares what he's doing strategically in a, in a bigger picture sense. So if we rightly handle the, our part, he will start to invite us into, as he said, I'll search the earth for who I can talk to to discuss my plans. I'm looking for someone who will actually I can have a conversation with. And the, the revolution of the prophetic in us has been to repoint us back to God's looking for a communication, but we thought it was just about us says the Lord and, you know, get on with it and you're a good guy and you're going to go far. No, no, he's like, I want relationship. Yes, I'm using the prophetic word to smash down the stuff that's blocking you and to get you to look up instead of down, but the other side is that invitation, actually the, the deeper experience is actually to go stay in there with him. From here I, I actually come out fully empowered to walk back into my natural realm, to my spheres of influence and change things. He said if those people had actually gone in, I'll go back to the, um, the verse, um, in Jeremiah there, 22, 20, uh, verse, sorry, Jeremiah 23, verse 22, but if they had stood in my counsel, they would have caused my people to hear. So one of the things that happens in, in church life a lot is that those who do not deeply process have a lot to say. It changes nothing. But when someone stands up and who has really waited on the Lord and gone through the preparation and then they stand there and they deliver a word, my God, we've got the sense of now they're speaking. That's why we get that expression being an oracle of God. So in other words, God was present in the word, in the room, so God delivered the word. Why? Because there was a work of preparation on the vessel. So you and I are called to be oracles of God. Literally, that's how they perceived Paul and all the others when they went and turned cities on their ears in a single day. Because the word of God came in for someone who spent so much time in God's presence. So when they drew back out into the natural realm, the word that they heard in the spirit, people couldn't help but be confronted by the reality of God. He manifested himself in that situation. So here's the challenge, you know, like if you'd stood in my council, if you really were there, not just Facebook posting your favourite word, if you really were there, I'd see this because when you came out and encountered the people that were tough to turn, they would have turned. When you came out and encountered situations that should have changed and standing against you, they would have changed. Now, I'm not saying that as a, you know, as a criticism or saying... If, you haven't, if you've got stuff that's resisting you, you, you you're, you're missing it. I'm just saying that's part of the promise here. The promise is if you come out with the word of God living and alive in you, it too from you now will not return void because you are made in his image to carry his authority. That's just where dominion comes from. So we were chatting in the break. The lady asked me to reread the Terminus word. 
And I was talking about, in fact, you know, in the, in the progression of that word, I mentioned this will be dominion. Well, you can get saved and get the gift of salvation, no qualification. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit, no qualification, except you're saved. You can have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, no qualification, except that you're saved. You can be called to the fivefold, no qualification, except that you're saved. But you can't move in dominion and authority unless you've actually paid the price. And so there's a preparation that goes with that. Some things are grace. Thank God they are. But some things are actually by, you know, by taking it seriously, by pressing into God. We grow in that and he trusts us more and more. To him who's been faithful for a little, I'll give great authority. In fact, where God goes back and says, to him who's been faithful for a little, I will give dominion over cities. So God's actually hyperbolting. This is the way to rule in your sphere of influence. So this is the conversation that leads to that. I'm mindful that that time is uh, racing away. So to me, level one is to perceive, to discern, to know there's something here, something that can be grasped and understood. There's something, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tuning my senses enough not to knock it out in the first instance. Okay, something. Hang on, God was in there. I'll be, I, I don't preach that often, but in my early days I would, share words and I would get the spirit of revelation come on me and I would go I've got to go back and study that out I've never heard that before and and you're seeing everyone just stand up you know when, when God brings out something you go, wow and I'm, oh, I'm as wow as the rest of them I'm going wow but, I'm, but I, I'll tell you I've got I use an app called uh, Evernote um, you can use I've got 367 notes on Evernote I have word after word after word that I have pulled apart and studied and I've added to it after years. And I've been in some meeting. Well, I remember one of the great ones was Lance Warner where he was preaching on something and he talked about throwing the chairs over in the spirit of mammon. And I had a dream three months earlier where God talked about a, a certain thing that had happened and he, and he blew up the whole place. You know, and in the dream I said, you can't turn over all the furniture, you're mucking it up, it's not our place. You know, and, and, and then God blew the whole joint up anyway. So it was good. But... But it's like, I, but I'm, I'm holding those things. I'm saying to God, I don't know what you're saying fully yet on some of this stuff. It could take me, some of these prophets held words for decades. But God didn't, God started early enough knowing it takes that long sometimes. Like he's proved you're faithful and I'll open my counsel to you. Prove that you're really serious about it. Stay, stay with that open heartedness. Don't be satisfied with shallow answers or casual conversations. So I've got lots and lots of words where I, where I um, literally uh, just keep going back to them at times. I'll get a little bit more insight. I'll add a little bit more. And I'd like the words to, uh, to justify preaching. It's like he gave me a... Res- he got, put something stirred and said, here, go get it. I want to uncover everything he says to uncover. I don't care. I used to get pretty discouraged in the fact that everyone else was rolling them out off the pulpit. I'll be honest, pride. I used to go, oh, you gave me all these secret words and, and now you've kept me out of the pulpit so long everyone else has talked about them and I've never had my moment. And then he said, well, we can deal with that. <laughs> and he has been. Because that's just pride. I should just celebrate the fact that I was, I, God spoke to me and that he used somebody else. But, you know, having now hooked me in, I'm still passionately pursuing all those things that he's still, it's, we get given a seed by working with a seed, it produces a tree. This is the same. It, it, it's so God, isn't it? So level two, through a conscious decision to hear deeply so that we have a true understanding of what's being said, can be gained. So I must attach faith to this. God's spoken to me. I can by faith. He's going to keep unpacking this. He's going to keep encountering me about this. I've got to believe actually I'm worthy of the opportunity. You know, sometimes we get offered to walk through the door and we're still sitting outside going, yeah, but he didn't, he didn't write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to me. Yeah, but he didn't come outside of the room and say, would you please come in now? It's like I've got all sorts of reasons why I'm not qualified. Oh, I've got to remove those disqualifications off my life. So the more often I handle these words, the more I have to deal with those things and I'm shifting those things out of my way. So I get more faithful and more accurate with it. So... A deeper understanding of what's being said can be gained. We mark, which means to attend, give heed, incline. Mark well, regard. We see a a weightiness for applying to this, a seriousness for applying. Um, And literally lean into the sound to discern the truth. 
until we deeply hear what God is saying at our spirit level. The causative dimension is where we take actions that will cause a response from God. So the causative dimension is that the word comes in and like all things that God does, he speaks into something in order for it to radiate glory back to him, doesn't it? When you put the sun in place, he filled it with the glory of a role it has to do. So he spoke into it and it radiates glory back. He put into man, he says, I put into you, now you're to radiate back the glory that I've given you. He said, uh, Jesus even did it to us. He said, the glory I've been given, I'm going to give to you. My father gave it to me, I give it to you. So there's a causative aspect of this. When God speaks into us, there's a, cause, there's a causative. He speaks in to cause us to shine glory back towards him. So I've got to take, got to take that pretty seriously. And, and, and ten, uh, I do, do put a bit of intenseness to it myself. Because I can be lazy. So I've got to give myself a good giddy along. I don't know how to say that in a mixed room. <laughs> um, you know, so, so these are some of the ways that we can listen. And we all know God is a great fan of second wind, second time, second visitation. So this revisiting faculties he's put inside of us and this relationship where he's asking us to deeply process the word and the encounter with him so fits with the nature of how he develops us. Because he said, I'll come to you a second time. I'll, the wind will blow on you a second time. So God's looking. He says, I put a seed in, it grows so far, and then I blow on it again, and it grows even further. I put an anointing on your life, and I'll come back and I'll revisit it. There'll be wave upon wave that will visit your life. If, you, if you've been consistent in any particular gift, you'll, no, you'll remember when a gift you were being used in got lifted to another level, and it stayed at that level, and got lifted to another level. And it sta- as God has that, he comes in waves. And we talk about when the Holy Spirit in the meeting, when the Holy Spirit comes in like a wave. These are just parts of his, not just his attributes, but his personality. So the, these things all add up to hear, to hear from him in this particular way. So I want to pray for you guys today. If you, if you would like to take up that opportunity for the Lord to hear victory, I'd like to pray and say, okay, by impartation, Paul said, you know, I'd love to love to be with you guys so I can release a gift to you that you would actually be established and move further forward in your walk with the Lord. And so it's by impartation. I believe greatly in impartation. So what I'd love to do is pray for those who would like to get more activated in this area of hearing God. And, it's, and it is, as it, um, as it is most things in life, there is, there is a vacating of the old to make room for the new. But the quickest way we can vacate the old is to cram like man in the new. Don't focus on the fallen, focus on the, the risen. So we fa- as we focus on the Lord, and he, oh, oh, I wish I could take this in. Oh, I hear that, you know, disappointment, whatever we're talking to you. Okay, I'm going to deal with disappointment. Go on, deal with that. So I can make more room for you. Because now I actually have a, a purpose. It's not just because disappointment is a bad feeling. I've got this excitement of building something fresh and new and it's, and it's something I really want to give to. Most of us are actually dying for something to give ourselves to. That's why we gave ourselves to the Lord. But then you sort of reach a plateau and you feel like you're dying again for wanting to give yourself to something. And that's what this encounter does for us too. We're constantly going through that. Not, just, not a sense of excitement, but we're revisiting so we go up and up and up and deeper. Deep calls on to deep. The sun of the sea. Let his waves wash over me. Let him call me out into the waters. And then the billows, and these big thundering crashing waves come crashing over me. So, if you would like me to pray for you. And sorry, before we do that, sorry, I'm curious, John. Um, we should give a few moments if anyone has any questions. So, I know some, probably for many of us, unusual round today. So I also want to give an opportunity if, I've, if your experience has been different and I've caused, you know, you've you come up with questions that's really confounded you. Is there anything like, anyone have any questions they'd really like answered about the out of what I've shared or um, just want to offer that opportunity? Everybody's pretty happy. I've been there generally because sometimes we come from different backgrounds. And there you go. Keys are there. Great Scott. Spoke to the Holy Spirit, put him back in my bag in the name of Jesus. 
Bless you. 